Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll just let everyone roll in while we start the webinar tonight. But I'm Zoe and I'm a campaign manager here at Virtual. And obviously, you're joining the Medigrowth Investor Web um, Q&A session. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm on the Wurundjeri country or land of the Kulin Nation tonight, and I want to pay my respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Um, very quickly, I'll introduce you to a little bit about what crowdsource funding is, if you're not familiar. Um, Adam, next slide, please. Uh, Virtual is working with Medigrowth Australia tonight and, well, sorry, on an upcoming crowdsource funding offer. And uh, Virtual is a financial services agency and is governed by ASIC. Uh, a lot of the companies, or sorry, all the companies who hold raises on Virtual go through quite intense, um, uh, sorry, intense um like approval processes to make sure that they are ready to hold a raise. And um, crowdsource funding is, uh, next slide, sorry, Adam. Crowdsource funding is a relatively new form of fundraising in Australia and allows uh, a lot of the broader public to make investments in, you know, exciting startups and emerging companies like they haven't been able to before. Um, just a few things that I wanted to chat about before I throw to the founders tonight is um, how to invest in virtual and what is the process that you need. And this is a frequently asked question that we get a lot. So currently we're wrapping out our wrapping up our expression of interest campaign, which has been really wonderful because there's been a lot of interest in Medigrowth Australia. Um, and we'll be heading into opening up the offer next Tuesday on the 1st of August. And the offer stage is where we can start accepting investments from people like you, invest, potential investors. Um, the offer stage just allows you to purchase regular shares or ordinary shares. And, um, you know, Virtual's whole ethos is to simplify fundraising and make it as easy process as possible. Um, there's a few really important documents that you should consider when you are making your investment, which is the offer document, which tells you a lot about the company's current financial position and how it plans to use funds. Um, there's also a constitution there, which tells you a lot about your rights as a shareholder in Medigrowth Australia. So I really encourage you to become familiar with those documents and know what kind of investment you're making. Um, the second one is a question we get a lot from investors, and that's how do I get a return on my investment? And uh, crowdsource funding shares are quite different from other shares that you might have purchased or know about. And usually you're investing in early stage or growing companies, and their plans would be to reinvest their earnings or um, returns back into the growth of the company, but they could also give that to their shareholders if they are making at a point of particular profit. So once again, it's really important to become familiar with the documents and understand how that all works. Um, a lot of these companies that do hold raises with virtual are usually looking um, to grow their business significantly and then either sell them um, or list them on the ASX or IPO or find a particular exit, which would benefit the shareholders that also belong to the company too. Um, so that's enough from me. And now I'm going to throw over to Adam and Todd to let you know all about Medigrowth Australia. Hey, uh, so thanks for bearing with us, guys. Uh, who are we and who is Medigrowth? Um, we'll get to the, the official introductions in a moment. But firstly, what is Medigrowth? We're a uh, a licensed medicinal cannabis biotech, and we're looking to reimagine medicine through innovation, collaboration, and world-class research. Really, what we're looking to achieve with Medigrowth is a host of things, and it's all really centered around how we can improve um, access, affordability, and, and quality of life for patients. And that has really been driven home to us uh, in the last couple of weeks as we've been talking to many, many potential investors and in, in turn, many, many patients and many people with direct sort of uh, connection to, to um, patients whose lives have been really incredibly uh, improved by access to, to medicinal cannabis here in Australia. So we're very um, proud to, to be in an industry where we believe we can make a really tangible difference to quality of life for, for patients. And that's really driving our, our um, development of our business pillars. 
across distribution, developing IP and clinical trials, and really pushing towards the development of, of TGA registered medicines in the cannabinoid medicine space. And that's how we believe we can really differentiate Medigrowth as uh, a leader here in Australia uh, with global ambitions. Um, I'm Adam Guskic. You might know me as the uh, non-tech savvy uh, gentleman of the Medigrowth team. <laughs> uh, I've been involved in Medigrowth since inception. Uh, 2017, we first registered uh, one of the companies involved now in, in the entire group structure of Medigrowth. Uh, and Todd and I have been working uh, really tirelessly on our really our ambition uh, to be not only a leader in the space, but to make really positive impact in, in patient outcomes uh, and uh, build a, a serious commercial opportunity at the same time. So from my perspective, uh, there's, there's no one with a greater passion and dedication to, to the mission that they're on. Uh, and I think both Todd and myself can humbly say now that we are uh, veterans in, in the uh, medicinal cannabis space here in Australia after you know being uh, involved for several years and really right from the early days in the industry. And I'll uh, pass over to Todd. Thank you, Adam, and thank you everyone for joining and hanging in there for the uh, through those few minutes. Uh, so yeah, I'm Todd McClellan, one of the co-founders of Medigrowth. Uh, I'm a Canadian expat. I came to Australia in 1998. Uh, so to give you a, a little bit of a visual representation to what that means, when I arrived in Australia, I had both hair on top of my head and none of my whiskers were, were as gray or white as they are now. Um, so fast forward to 2017, uh, and Adam and I, as he said, incorporated um, Medigrowth Australia Proprietary Limited. And our intention then was really to be integral in the medicinal cannabis industry in Australia. And really, it was about helping people. Uh, now, some might say that's not a, uh, a savvy commercial um, decision to make, but at the time, there was only about 200 uh, scripts for medicinal cannabis. So I dare say, had we have pursued that commercial interest, then we wouldn't be here to inter introduce ourselves to you uh, tonight. So uh, next slide. Thanks, Adam. So really looking at there, there's an immense opportunity from, from a treatment and therapeutics position. There's ongoing every week, it, it appears there's a new indication that's, that medicinal cannabis is treating. Uh, and we really do believe that the clinical val validation and registered cannabinoid medicines is where the opportunity lies. Uh, and we do believe that other markets around the world that have um, perhaps been first to market in the medicinal cannabis space hasn't fully explored uh, these opportunities. Next slide. So as Adam mentioned, we really have two pillars to the business. We have a revenue generating side to the business. Um, so from that side, we have a oper operational national distribution center. Uh, we have multiple channels of distribution for our products to head into, whether that be GPs in their own clinic, uh, telehealth clinics, medicinal cannabis clinics, or formularies. Also Haiku Health, a telehealth platform that we've developed here at, at Medigrowth. Uh, and all of those products are currently in a human research ethics committee uh, quality of life trial uh, that is supported by Deakin University. Uh, and that's really about getting the data from those indications and those products being prescribed. Are they working? How well are they working? Are they worth pursuing registration of uh, uh, registered medicines? So on the right hand side there, the IP generation. So they are quite integrated, really one feeding the other. So as I said, Deakin University being a, a remarkable supporter of the randomized controlled trial for kids with autism, that's a phase one and two trial. That's also being supported by uh, Swinburne University as well. I, I think we need to make sure that um, we recognize all those collaborators who are supporting uh, these events. Below that, the ARC or Australian Research Council Training Centre for Biomedical Analysis, that's being held over at the University of WA, and that has a, an incredibly deep pool of industry partners who are collaborating there alongside educational institutions to really translate research and, and innovate in a space that, um, that hasn't been innovated much before. The Hemp CRC, that cooperative research center, is very similar, a pool of uh, industry partners and collaboration with, with other institutions. 
And then the last image there at the bottom is a, a fully licensed by the Office of Drug Control, uh, Medigrill Center of Excellence or Enablement, as we might call it. Uh, that's really to facilitate a long-term timeline and, uh, and really future-proof the opportunity. Next slide, thanks. So national distribution, so three Medigrill products in market. Currently, we have two oils, a CBD 100 and a Balance 12.5 as well as a THC 22% flour, um, all Australian made, Australian go grown uh, products there, all meeting the AEGMP pharmaceutical quality, uh, being prescribed by GPs, uh, whether that be, like I said before, in their own clinic, uh, perhaps in telehealth or through a cannabis clinic. And again, the HREC approval for the quality of life, uh, really trying to understand the data, the indications and the products uh, how it's how it's being received out there by patients. Next slide. Growth trajectory. So the the 2,800 percent year on year revenue growth for financial 2022 to 2023, we're very proud of. Uh, recognize we start where we start. Um, so that will be supported by that ongoing 30 percent um, average monthly revenue growth. Uh, obviously, for there to be such growth in the industry, it's really those gatekeepers being the uh, the prescribers, and and that's had a marked increase since 2016. There's there's no doubt about that. But probably the the most interesting number for me on this slide is the 200 plus indications approved by the TGA. So if you hop into the uh, TGA SASB data and pull a report from there, you'll see over 200 indications since inception of the medic medicinal cannabis scheme there. Um, I struggled to find a specific product that, although varying different forms, can treat that many different indications. So I'm really excited about, about that number. Uh, next slide. So Haiku Health, this was born out of trying to empower patients. We found that patients were coming to us and looking for somewhere to get prescribed cannabis. Uh, and in particular, the early days, that was a difficult um, thing to be able to do because it was a second line um, prescription. Uh, so we would point them in direction of, of prescribers and then really lose touch with if they were getting results, uh, if they weren't. So we saw this as an opportunity to really empower the patients to provide a seamless, uh, frictionless service, something that we're all very familiar with telehealth now. Uh, we're also all very familiar with wanting to have um, products delivered to our home. So this was something that, uh, that we felt we could best facilitate and, uh, and had great results so far. Next slide. So coming back to that real world data, I think it's very important for us to understand what products are being used for specific indications um, from a Medigrowth perspective uh, and potentially what traditional pharmaceuticals are being used and not providing uh, appropriate therapeutic benefit for those patients. So we felt this was very important. Again, and Deacon being a, a huge supporter of this uh, is facilitating from a, uh, a blinded data to Medigrowth, uh, but certainly unblinded in an indication and product um, prescription point of view so that we can really understand where the next steps are to follow uh, in pursuit of TGA registered medicine. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Uh, and just just to carry on a little bit from from uh, the the collaboration side, as Todd's mentioned, you know a, a lot of collaborative work that we've really established right from inception, uh, and very much by design to try and align with leaders in research here in Australia that we believe can really open up the doors for us globally uh, and really in our pursuit of, of registered medicines and registered uh, cannabinoid medicines. So as Todd said, Deakin University have been a long-term collaboration uh, uh, um, research partner of ours, uh, but that's led to a whole host of other uh, connectivity into, into both um, research in institutions uh, and some of the uh, training centres like that ARC training centre that, that Todd had mentioned before, all of which are really uh, driving Medigrowth in a direction uh, well and truly beyond uh, a pure play, um, you know, medicinal cannabis company and giving us opportunities to, to work with some of those leaders in, in their fields. And I think that's really important to note. Uh, 
Um, equally, uh, just some of the, the regulatory and government bodies that, that we uh, have dealt with over time, uh, really just to highlight the fact that this is a very highly regulated in, uh, industry. There are very um, high barriers to entry for a lot of, you know, a lot of players. It's certainly not something uh, that's a simple process to, to undergo licensing. Uh, so we've dealt with a number of the government agencies in terms of our operations, uh, Office of Drug Control for all of our cultivation and uh, manufacturing and research licensing, uh, Department of Health for our wholesale storage and, and uh, distribution licensing. So for, from our perspective, we're, we're very much proven our ability uh, to both uh, work uh, alongside and collaborate with um, uh, research and uh, um, educational institutions, but certainly also to comply with that sort of oversight and regulatory uh, bodies. And part of that, uh, I guess, coming back to the collaboration is finding that uh, really critical thinking team that we can really have supporting our operations. Uh, and we're working with some incredible minds, uh, part of the uh, Deakin University Pediatric Autism Study. We have uh, some of our research advisory committee uh, who are directly involved in, in leading that study um, from the School, School of Medicine, School of Psychology, uh, and these are people that are working already with many of the patient um, uh, cohort that we're dealing with. So are very experienced in, in our areas of clinical interest. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have some amazing people uh, really assisting us on our journey. And I think that's only going to help commercially as, as we move forward as well. Uh, as Todd mentioned, the um, Paediatric autism trial is a phase one, currently in phase one and two. By the end of the year, we believe we'll be um, towards the end of the phase two um, of, of that particular trial. Uh, and there are results, uh, interim results due in October, which all of a sudden is not too far away. So we're, we're very excited about really what the clinical data will say, because we've, we've had uh, strong indications um, anecdotally and from our, our current prescribing in uh, or, or supply of product to prescribers in market currently that there are uh, kids with autism and, and with ADHD and anxiety and a whole host of things that are being benefited in some cases by medicinal cannabis. And now it's trials like this that gives companies like Medigrowth an opportunity to really bring that um, critical, robust data uh, to, to then take uh, to the next stage of, of development of phase three trials, for example, if the data is supportive, and that then moves towards how do we, how do we then tackle the next stages of, of registering medicines. Uh, really, the, the three um, areas of interest that we're looking at in, in our current form, the paediatric autism, the advanced oncology care, which is really focusing on uh, cachexia and anorexia within uh, cancer patients or can, uh, having treatment with cancer. Uh, it's a huge market uh, and a, a huge sort of human benefit if we can sort of look to, to really drive that market and, and uh, bring some of the, the critical data. And we're looking at uh, the uh, protocol development currently, again, in collaboration uh, with a couple of universities that we're dealing with, uh, Deakin University and uh, University of Technology in Sydney have been assisting on uh, really uh, bringing the, the protocol to life there. So that's something else that we're very excited to be moving forward on. And uh, last but not least, there is the ARC Training Centre, uh, which really is an amazing opportunity to leverage a whole host of incredible industry expertise across uh, pharmaceutical and, and life science and healthcare uh, and government support uh, to, for us as a company, to start to look at uh, the uh, bioprospecting uh, uh, capabilities of those um, high throughput screening uh, technologies to look at how certain uh, cannabis molecules can be uh, delivered across certain disease cell lines. And it's a very complicated process, but there's some incredible people working on assisting in, in the development of, of that uh, research. And again, that gives us the opportunity to probably fast track some of the, the preclinical work that often takes considerable time uh, and, and resources to get to the, the first um, stages of, of clinical trial development. So very excited to be a part of such an incredible um, team. 
Uh, and again, uh, testament to probably the, uh, I think the respect that Medigrowth has earned over the, the course of dealing uh, for now several years uh, with a very um, consistent and dedicated approach to our, our research uh, commitment. Why are we doing all of this? So I think if we look at, um, I guess, the, the two main reasons, there's, there's a great human impact for certainly the three areas that we've got a very um, high degree of focus on. Uh, the, the cancer um, issue and, and the cachexia anorexia as a um, indication of, of uh, cancer treatment is something that's an incredible burden uh, on patients and, and certainly something that we're seeing uh, data reflecting in 80 odd percent of all cancer patients suffering from, from those indications. So uh, with 20 odd million new cancer ca cases per year, uh, not only uh, is that something that can have incredible um, impact on patient uh, well-being uh, equally, there is incredible commercial opportunity there for any company that was working towards uh, the you know uh, next steps on on cannabis medicines that may help uh, on a on a registered medicine space. The autism spectrum disorder is the same, uh, incredibly widespread uh, globally in, in terms of um, people on the on the spectrum, uh, and really with no cure for that particular indication. There are treatments uh, to try and help uh, people and families uh, work within many of the. Uh, difficulties that those those patients have in their day to day living, uh, but again, there's a huge opportunity to to not only help uh, a vast range of people, but a, a major commercial opportunity. And last, certainly not least, is the mental health crisis that we continue to hear about globally, uh, with even in Australia a 635 odd million dollar uh, prescription spending, uh, but globally it's a multi billion dollar uh, issue. Uh, and certainly something that I, I think has touched most people uh, know somebody that's having issues on on some level in in mental health. I think there's a, a stat uh, that we're talking about one in eight people uh, have a, a mental health uh, disorder of some description. So it's certainly something that well and truly warrants uh, some investigation and it's a, an area of interest from our side. Uh, Todd mentioned the uh, Centre of Excellence, and that's a uh, proposed development that's now uh, recently had uh, some publicity uh, on uh, a number of mediums uh, as a, a fully town planning approved uh, development. So from our perspective, it's really uh, the next phase of development for us as a, as a company, pushing through uh, in the next, next uh, phase post virtual, really trying to uh, develop uh, some serious revenue generation on our distribution, uh, working through those pillars across to research, and then really future-proofing our operations with uh, a manufacturing R&D and, and genetics facility, uh, again, that would have some university co-location. Uh, and we believe that that's really something that will not only drive innovation, but drive strategic partnerships, uh, both nationally and globally. Uh, and in fact, we have been in discussions uh, with a with an international company who's expressed uh, interest in in working with us uh, in assisting on on perhaps next steps on on something along those lines. So, very excited to be to be working towards that as part of the the big picture, mid to long term picture for for many growth. Uh, and just to finish, really, uh, because we're trying to trying to keep plenty of time for questions, and I can see that there are plenty of questions rolling in there. Uh, in many of the conversations we've had, uh, there, there have been queries on, on use of funds uh, as part of this raise. And really for us, we've spent now several years, five plus years building uh, a platform that we believe is really re absolutely ready, uh, investor ready and ready to springboard us as a, as a company into our, our next phase of growth. And really number one on that list is to expand our distribution opportunity. Uh, and that's, as Todd said, we've got multiple channels now in terms of the way we're delivering products to Australian patients. Uh, and the opportunity for us there is to start to add additional products to our range, more, more pharmaceutical oils, more Australian grown flour, uh, and a host of other um, options, delivery options that might just uh, not only fill the prescribing gaps, but it give um, us as a company uh, potentially a huge jump in uh, in uh, revenue opportunity. Uh, 
building the, the team. Um, we've said it before, we want to work with the best people uh, out there to really drive MediGrowth home as a, as a leader in the space. And I think that will only help drive the revenue and, and build everything that we've put in as a platform. Uh, continuing on the clinical trial uh, phase and, and all of the R&D development for, for both um, clinical trials for, for the indications in those areas of interest, uh, but also for um, novel product development that may not be in market currently that we can really um, leverage and utilise some of those university relationships to assist with. Uh, and as I said previously, just to progress that uh, Medigrowth Centre of Excellence. So lots of exciting things for us to, to continue working on. And finally, just to finish, uh, the question has been asked uh, several times uh, during the last couple of weeks of Todd and myself on, on uh, speaking to many potential investors, why equity crowdfunding? Uh, and we keep coming back to our tagline that's become almost a bit of a mantra for us here at Medigrowth, and that's uh, imagine if a single plant could change the world. And more and more people we speak to, we're, we're recognising that already this is changing so many people's lives uh, for the better. We're seeing patients with incredible stories and personal connections to how, how it's improved quality of life. So we're trying to build a community. We're trying to spread the word that this is something that's well and truly investable from not only a commercial perspective, but from a human perspective. So I wanted to take the opportunity just to thank everyone for, for being involved and, uh, and really sharing in our mission. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Todd. Um, so we, yeah, we're gonna start our Q&A session now. Uh, there are quite a few questions coming through and I'm not sure if we will be able to get through, through all of them tonight. Um, I also think it's very important to mention to everyone that there are over 5,000 people who have expressed interest in investing in Medigross. So while Todd and Adam are obviously doing their best to try and engage with each and every one uh, of you who have expressed interest, it's not <laughs> entirely possible to do so at the moment. So we will definitely be doing our best to um, answer the most frequently asked questions tonight. And I really encourage all of you to go ahead and read the offer document when that's available on Tuesday when the offer opens, because that will include a lot of information about the company's plans and goals and current position. Um, Chris uh, just also asked, when does the EOI close and what is your total target? And I wrote back in that question disappeared. So I thought I should just answer that very quickly. Um, expressions of interest close uh, at 10 p.m. on this coming Monday night. Um, the benefit of expressing your interest is that you get the chance to invest when the offer is in a private stage. So that means um, you get to be one of the first investors. And, you know, if Medigrowth reached their target, it might only be available for um, the investors in the private stage. Um, and a lot of information about the terms of the offer will also be available when the offer goes live. And I'll probably sound like a broken record saying that from now on, but I will keep saying it. Um, so the first question is from Susie, and Susie actually has two questions. Um, so the first question is, what is your current market share in Australia? And uh, how do you differentiate yourself from the competition? So market share and competition. It's uh, the market share question, I think, is actually a very difficult one to answer. It, you know, there's there's TGA data that reflects uh, both uh, authorised prescribers and special access scheme prescriptions. Uh, I think the, the honest answer to that is that uh, probably it's something that even the TGA is unable to, to actually uh, nominate exactly how many scripts have been uh, written because some of some of those complexities about how they track the data is difficult. So I'd probably, uh, I'm not avoiding the question, but I'll take a pass on, on that first phase of the question. What I will say on that is that we've seen incredible growth in the past 12 months, uh, and particularly even in the last six months, we've seen you know the bulk of our, our growth over the, the course of this year. And I think it's really um, very much based on uh, starting to raise the profile of Medigrowth. I think the more people in, in the medical fraternity that are understanding what we do and how we're connected to a lot of research and a lot of uh, really legitimate sort of uh, university and, and government funded uh, organisations, for example, like the ARC Training Centre, uh, I think that's really driving the profile and we, we will continue to see more, more growth and more market share. Uh, 
Um, this, the second, refresh my memory on the second part of the question there, Zoe. How do you differentiate yourself? Differentiation. Uh, look, I think that's, again, so much about the, um, the research and the collaboration. There's many, there are companies in, you know, when we look at medicinal cannabis companies in Australia, there are, there's always competition and there are many that fall into a whole host of different areas of the supply chain. So if we look at um, some that are purely based on cultivation, some that are manufacturers, some that are purely based on distribution. I think for us, we've got a few um, key differentiators on the way we're looking to establish uh, an opportunity on revenue immediately. That's something that already is happening with products in market. Uh, but secondary to that, we've really got that global ambition on how do we take out our company to the next level as a, a registered medicine company. And there's not many doing that. There are some, to be fair, uh, but many aren't focused on that. And probably the third part of that is that we're very focused on, as an Australian company, on Australian products. Right from inception, we've supported Australian cultivated flour and Australian made oils. Uh, others are doing that too, but many are importing products. Uh, so for us, uh, it's certainly important to drive that messaging home that we're an Australian company uh, with two two blokes here that, uh, you know, had a vision and had a dream and wanted to really, really support the Australian industry for Australian patients. Thank you, Adam. No um, Sarah's asked, is there any red tape in Australia that would prevent the estimated growth of Medigrowth? There are stacks of red tape, but none of that red tape is going to affect our growth. We're, we're starting from a, a place of a very organic um, revenue growth. Uh, we have a limited uh, sales force out there. Uh, part of the use of funds here is to onboard medical science liaisons, to have them out talking to, to more doctors, more hospitals, more clinics. Um, so to answer the question, from a red tape perspective, we're already licensed across the ODC for medicinal cannabis. We have our, our schedules and wholesale license, poisons license, low THC licenses. Um, so I don't see that as being a hurdle for, for Medigrowth in the future as we secure our and continue to secure our growth. Thank you, Todd. Uh, this question's from Jeremy. Uh, does Medigrowth have any IP or exclusive unique strain strains, or is your offer to market a commodity? So, um, yeah, do you have IP on the products or do you think your particular product is quite a commodity compared to others in the market? I think that's the real opportunity ahead of us. Uh, for us, uh, we've got uh, a relatively small skew line at the moment. We've got three products in market, two oils and, and one Australian grown flour. And part of what uh, we've been working on uh, over the course of this year is really looking at as part of this raise, how do we how do we take Medigrowth to the next phase now that we've built all of the supply channel uh, opportunities, including the, the telehealth, including multiple third-party distributors and uh, the ability to sell direct to pharmacies and all the things that we're doing. Uh, the next step is to really build those products that does build that sort of uh, defendable moat around us. So to answer the question, um, the products that we have in market at the moment, uh, one of those products, for example, is uh, the CBD product that's part of the paediatric autism trial. So there's a degree of uh, defendability around that product in the sense that, you know, many other products in, in a um, equivalent or comparable nature uh, don't have a lot of that clinical um, um, oversight uh, in that particular product that's gone through a human research ethics committee approval to ensure that it's uh, a pharmaceutical grade safe it's going into the hands of five to 12 year old kids so it's it's gone through incredible scrutiny to ensure that you know that's uh, well and truly catered for uh, and probably secondary to that is uh, part of what we're looking to achieve on our next phase of products uh, and as recently as today we've been having conversations uh, with um, cultivation partners to try and have a look at what we can bring to market that would have that uh, very unique strain opportunity that uh, isn't in market currently and is something that then becomes really a, a Medigrowth-owned um, 
strain uh, for particular patients and, and that, that's the next steps for us. Thank you. Uh, this person is called Zoom user. Um, <laughs> um, pretty much the question is, do you think you're coming into the market late? Because uh, apparently there's a lot of other companies out there. Um, so yeah, what do you think? Are you late to the market? I think our timing is very good in the market. Uh, we've been around for six years, as we've said. Uh, we've seen those those early movers uh, perhaps deploy capital in ways that was less than efficient or less than successful uh, when there weren't there weren't patients available, there weren't doctors supporting prescribing product. So we believe with the the groundswell of patients and prescribers who are in the market at the moment. Uh, and probably to attribute to the 5,000 odd EOIs that we've got with so many more patients and so many more people affected um, positively by medicinal cannabis, we believe our timing is really good. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, we have been asset light and very nimble to be able to move with where the market is headed. Uh, and many of those who have come before us find themselves in a position of possibly being burdened with a quarter to quarter uh, requirement of a result um, that may be, maybe as we move uh, quickly and quietly, we can, uh, we can achieve better results. Thank you. This one's from Adam. Um, is medicinal cannabis legal in every state and territory at the moment? And do you also expect cheaper competition from overseas? It definitely is legal, Adam. Uh, so the, in terms of a medicinal framework, uh, medicinal cannabis can be prescribed by any, any licensed uh, practitioner, GP uh, specialist or, or nurse practitioner uh, in any state and territory here in Australia. There are varying regulations state to state that, that uh, do vary just in the way the mechanics of that work, but it, it's, uh, it is a, a nationwide uh, legality. Um, and in terms of the import question, yes, there are imports into the country. I think, again, we're seeing a lot of uh, respect and support by both patients and prescribers for the Australian grown, not only, not only the loyalty to Australian grown, but I think just the quality controls that come with Australian made products, the pharmaceutical oversight that, that goes into the medicinal oils, for example, uh, is of a, of a global standard uh, and is recognised all over the world as really being one of or the highest quality Europe, um, AUGMP and uh, EU GMP uh, connectivity in terms of, of the oversight there. So uh, I think, yes, there will be uh, overseas imports uh, and that's really then a, a product differentiation position for companies like Medigrowth to say, well, how, how are our products better? And we, we believe that will be with some of the uh, robust clinical data that we can bring behind some of those products, but really then on developing uh, as we discussed before, some of those unique genetics, for example, that might put us in a different position and some unique product development. That's not really just a matter of many of those things aren't an off-the-shelf opportunity. They're, they're um, IP development opportunities that we'd be looking at establishing as we move forward. Thanks. Um, oh, sorry. I think I just lost one. Oh, no. Uh, are there plans to move into the recreational cannabis space if laws get loosened? And that was from Tom, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in there. Uh, thanks, Tom. I think um, should adult use become available in Australia, I believe that medicinal cannabis companies who are regulated, compliant, active in the market with secure supply chains, um, will do quite well if they choose to participate in the adult use market. Uh, I, don't, we, I don't think that Medigrowth believes that there's any detriment to our business model should that come about. In fact, it would probably only open up an additional channel of potential revenue for Medigrowth. And I think it just, just to follow up on that, all of those um, revenue opportunities uh, will all support that second pillar of our business, which is really that longer term R&D development and, and um, 
registration side of the medical registration side of the business that we're we're aiming for. So I think any opportunity, if there's if there is a regulatory oversight that allows for that, and if there's a commercial opportunity, we believe that that's only going to supplement that big picture opportunity for us, which is really then to to look towards those registration of cannabinoid medicines that have got a global global stage, and then um, takes away any of those. Um, uh, or, or really probably highlights then the differentiation of those products uh, compared to, to the imports, for example, that were mentioned before. Thank you. Um, Adam, you answered this one before, but there might have been some people who missed it, so it might be good to just touch on again very quickly. But um, Jeremy was asking, what's Medigrowth's current share of the Australia slash New Zealand market? Uh, yeah, look, I, I guess I, I, the answer to that was relatively long-winded in the sense that it's a difficult one to answer uh, based on the fact of the way the TGA report um, all of the data. So uh, it's a it's a question that I, I answered probably in a backwards way to say uh, the share share of the market is is a growing share. Uh, where it stands at the moment, the truthful answer to that is I don't know exactly what our market share is. Uh, however, I will say that we're in a position where we've got strong support by prescribers, strong support by uh, a number of clinics and third party distributors. We've got our own telehealth, um, Haiku Health as a, as a network. Uh, and really, I think the, the projection for us is um, where are we today? Uh, we're in a position where we're ready to, to springboard for growth. We've got three products in market, which is a relatively small SKU line. Post virtual, we'll have funding and capital to, to allow us to really build that market share to a level that, uh, you know, I believe and we collectively believe uh, will be a, a very viable commercial position for Medigrowth. Thanks. Um, this one's from Kush, and I'm not too sure about the first question, but I'll put it to you. Um, is your product to be OST L or OST R registered? And maybe everyone needs an explainer on that if you know what that means, or if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> um, the T TGA registration is part of, I guess, the if you take it back a step to to that uh, research pillar side of our business, really the the. Um, ultimate goal for us to allow the maximum uh, accessibility and affordability for patients is to take medicines from the current state where there are a special access scheme or an authorised prescriber based medicine as the market is currently and work with clinical trials to then take them to a TGA registration. So um, without sort of delving into the exact specifics of which category that falls into, those multi-phase clinical trials, if supported, if the data is positive on a, a specific product for a specific indication, yes, our intent would be to work through uh, phase multi-phase clinical trials to a, a registered TGA medicine. Thanks. Uh, Philip has asked a question that I'll try and answer. And that question is, what is the crowdfunding percentage of shares on offer versus the total shares of your company? Uh, so Philip and everyone else, this information is going to be available in the offer document when the offer goes live on Tuesday. Uh, there's a part that says um, cap table or, sh you know, existing shares in the document. So you'll be able to see for yourself how much equity is give being given away um, as part of the virtual cap raise and also who the existing shareholders are and what percentage of the company they already hold. So please be sure to read that document. Um, this one's from Brent, and Brent's asked, will Medigrowth aim to have products listed on the PBS or with the PBS? Again, certainly our, and even it, it comes back to many of the conversations that I know I've had them, and I know Todd has as well, over the, the past couple of weeks with so many um, patients and families who are suggesting that the cost is quite prohibitive. And we're, we're the first to recognise that as, as an industry participant, that there needs to be better uh, patient access and patient affordability. I had a gentleman today that I was speaking to uh, with a, a, a daughter, um, an epileptic daughter, uh, and he was saying that they're spending about $1,000 a month uh, 
for for the, her medicine, life changing as it was. Uh, he, he was saying that she's gone from having up to 100 seizures a day now to not having seizures uh, based on her use of a CBD product. Um, so uh, again, a long winded way of saying absolutely. I think any of that clinical. Um, data that we can build on clinical trials and being our involvement in that space that may work towards the um, robust data on a, on a clinical trial through to a TGA registration. Once it's once a product is registered, then there's the opportunity to apply for, for a PBS um, government subsidy um, you know, approval. Uh, and absolutely, that would be on the radar, probably with the caveat of saying that that is obviously a process that is is not to be underestimated in, in the sense of time and, and resources to get there. But definitely, it's very much the reason why we've chosen to go down that um, research collaboration and partnership route to try and ensure that uh, we're working on things that ultimately can uh, really help to solve that uh, that issue. Thank you, Adam. Uh, this one's from Andres. Uh, oh, well, it's actually might not be, well, you might be able to talk to it, you might not be able to, but um, in regards to the suppliers that you use or in even regards to your operations, um, do you have a plan for managing hemp waste or do you know what your partners do to manage hemp waste? So we're a, we're a proposed industry partner in the hemp CRC, uh, a bid that's coming up uh, towards the end of this year. That's really all about uh, the circular economy and doing exactly that, looking at from hemp or medicinal cannabis, how those waste products can then be essentially uh, purposed from the start for other products, uh, whether that be with hemp and um, carbon sequestration of, uh, even if it's a matter of um, managing the stocks or waste and, and plowing that back into the soil. Uh, however, that might be, um, the circular economy is a, a key aspect of that group. And that is certainly something that we do look at from a, a sustainability point of view. Thanks, Todd. This one's from Ash. Um, Ash has said that his, and I'm sorry, Ash, I'm, Ash has said that their GP um, has said that using Australian products are twice the price of well Australian, well established, pardon me, Canadian companies. How do you foresee this big hurdle and challenge? So it seems like people are being prescribed Canadian products because they're cheaper. I, th I think it's there's a cross section of products and it probably is very dependent on on what type of product we're talking about for example um, flour if we're talking dried flour there can be a, a range of different um, genetics quality and, and potency that can affect the price of the product um, I think if, if you if you're looking at uh, broadly speaking if you're looking at imports of any, whether it's Canada or, or anywhere else in the world I think that's probably about to change because as of July 1 of this year or prior to July 1 of this year, there was not really a level playing field on Australian made products versus imported products from overseas. So prior to July 1, uh, companies could import products that didn't necessarily have to meet the, the same strict quality assurance as Australian manufacturers that are working under an Australian GMP um, certification. So the quality control um, comparison just wasn't there. So it's probably fair to assume that that gave potential companies that weren't working under a GMP um, facility ability to maybe uh, generate products that were cheaper, uh, but perhaps not under the so same level of, of quality control. Uh, as of July 1 this year, that has now levelled up. So any imported product has to also meet the same strict adherence to that GMP position. So I think there'll, there will definitely be a levelling up there. Uh, and I think we're as, a, as an industry, it's our job and as industry participants, it's our job to try and look at the efficiencies of our product offering to really uh, manage the the quality uh, and the price and the access points to ensure that all those things meet. So maybe we won't be the cheapest product in, in the land, but that's true of, of any commercial entity. There's always price comparisons. And I think for us, 
number one has always been the quality needs to come first and the assurance to patients to say that product that you're taking is a pharmaceutical grade product made in a, a strict clean room environment and there's been no shortcuts on you know what's in the bottle so for us we stand by that and I think our pricing certainly sits very well comparatively in the market because we you know we are a relatively uh, lean fighting machine in the way we run our our organization uh, and we'll continue really to drive that messaging home the quality of the products are there the research is happening in the background and um, and perhaps some of those players that have been able to um, work within the previous guidelines and now having to to look at their ability on on matching up the quality. Thanks, Adam. Um, we'll try and squeeze in a couple more questions. I'm happy to go a little bit over it because we still have 61 questions pending. Um, we'll try and just get through a few more, I think, and we'll try and send around an email with a good wrap up and recording of this session um, with internet issues not included. <laughs> um, <laughs> But Brent's asked, um, what are the current cash flow statistics of Medigrowth and is Medigrowth currently cash flow positive? And um, Brent, I'm just going to say that all that information will be available in the offer document when the offer opens on Tuesday. So um, a lot of information is shared about the company in the offer document. And I think it does give you a lot of you know, data and statistics to pull um, and look at for yourself. So, um, yeah, please be sure to download that and review it before making your investment. Um, Raj has asked, how many rounds of fundraising do you anticipate you will do? And um, how would there be a likelihood of being diluted with an initial investment? So, um I guess, you know, if you were to take on any investors after the virtual crowdsource funding raise that does, well, not necessarily does dilute shares of crowdsource funded investors, it's really important to read the company constitution that's also available when you make, you when you go to make your investment application, as this will tell you a lot about your rights as an investor and what is to happen, um, you know, with future investment. But also, um, you know, I'll throw it to Todd and Adam to just talk about whether they do anticipate further capital raising rounds to come. I might, I might kick this off. Um, what was it? Who's what? Was Sorry, the that was a Raj. very, I, yeah, that was very scrambled. Raj. Raj. Um, good question, Raj. I think first, uh, first and, and foremost, we are absolutely focused on this current funding round. Um, this raise, we've got extraordinary interest from the EOI perspective. Um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, 5,000 people plus on that list. We're trying to contact those people. And we have a use of funds that is directly related to the to this um, fundraising round. So we're absolutely focused on that currently. Um, going forward, there is a recognition that registered cannabinoid medicines will require more capital. Uh, and certainly that that center of excellence in time will as well. Um, so I, to be transparent, I wouldn't um, suggest that there won't be additional rounds, but our focus is absolutely uh, on this virtual campaign at current and uh, not really looking too much further beyond that currently. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Victoria's asked, um, where does Medigrowth obtain its cannabis from? And is there a plan to develop your own strains? So all of a, I've had a, a, a lot of conversations where that question has been asked. So just to be clear, we're not growing, uh, not cultivating our own cannabis. So we're partnered with a, a Victorian based uh, cultivation company. Uh, and we have a Victorian-based manufacturer uh, that, that supplies our uh, medicinal and pharmaceutical grade oils. Um, part of the uh, development of that centre of excellence, uh, there is a, an R&D um, and, and genetics opportunity that falls within that development. So to answer the second part of the question, I think, yes, there is definitely an opportunity to be working uh, alongside uh, cultivation partners and trying to bring some value to that part of the world. And equally, we have a very good network 
both here in Australia and globally, probably um, thanks to um, Todd's uh, Canadian expat status there, uh, with some uh, folks that may be in a position to help along that sort of generation of some some genetics that at least we could sort of start some of those programs and, and look to develop those as we mature uh, both as a company and, and as a market. Thank you. Um, I think I might throw the last one to you because I've seen it a few more times throughout the session tonight. And that is, um, you know, once again, what is your point of difference um, in particular, you know, how, what is your point of difference compared to international providers, but also a lot of players in the domestic market? I'm happy to jump on that that one again. I mean, we we've spoken about it internally a lot because we analyse obviously the the Australian market and what's happening globally on on quite a regular basis, and it's an evolving industry. That's the truth. There's a lot of changes and a lot of um, evolution, particularly you know obviously with our focus here in Australia currently. Uh, our real point of difference is the fact that I think we've got um, those two. Core pillars, uh, core pillars of the business that really intersect. Um, you know, I, I look at we were discussing earlier, uh, for example, a, a cultivation company. Yes, there are going to be some very successful cultivation companies who who can um, um, operate and and uh, really execute on their business plan well. Um, but there's a lot of uh, competition globally on that particular side of the supply chain. Uh, so for us, if we look at how we can really differentiate, it's really to say, how can we partner with some of the best companies who are executing well at what they do well, and we can really try and drive home uh, a, a very solid um, revenue generating plan, and we've already got that plan uh, operational, it's beyond a plan, it, it's, a, it's an executed sort of platform ready for the next phase of growth. And then really look to say, well, where do we go next? And that interconnects with that research and R&D pipeline, uh, which not many other players are doing. There are, yes, always others doing um, things in the background that we don't uh, or aren't always privy to. But even on the ASX, um, when you look at a number of the different um, cannabis companies to, to sort of plant them all in, in a, a bit of a broad sort of basket of, of medicinal cannabis companies, there's only a, a small selection who are very focused on uh, R&D and clinical trials and drug development all, and all that sort of thing. So for us, we see that ability to quickly drive our revenue with su support of the resources that we believe will come after the, the virtual campaign to really build that revenue to help support the R&D, which again, we believe will take us to the next phase of our business growth. And for us, that's genuinely very exciting because it's really an evolution of, of not only medi growth, but of uh, an industry that's been totally underserved for research for, for so long. Thank you, Adam. Uh, well, that's the end of our Q&A session tonight, everyone. We'll definitely like, make the recording available and try and distribute it to everyone who registered tonight and also attended. Um, thanks again very much to Adam and Todd for your insights into the business tonight. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that the offer will be open for investment this coming Tuesday on the 1st of August. Um, you've still got some time to go ahead and make yourself familiar as familiar as possible with the company by checking out the company profile, watching the pitch video and um, make an expression of interest so that you can get all the information going forward. Um, Thanks again. Be sure to read the offer document when investing and consider the risk warning to um, and make sure you're familiar with what crowdsource funding shares are compared to other shares that you could purchase. Uh, and thanks again and good night. Thanks, thanks Zoe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone for joining us. Much appreciated.